everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we have come to Fukagawa, which is in the eastern side of Tokyo. This part of town used to be very close to the old center of Edo, which was the name of Tokyo more than 150 years ago. You know, I heard that Fukagawa is the original birthplace of sumo wrestling. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. While the epicenter of sumo has relocated to Ryogoku, mm. there's still a few sumo stables left in this neighborhood. Mm, fascinating. So today we're going to be visiting the Fukugawa Edo Museum, which features a realistic recreation of an Edo period village. There's also a special sumo exhibit, which you can check out too. In the lobby of the museum, they now have a special limited time exhibition dedicated to the legendary sumo wrestler Taiho. And here it has a, you know, actual size of cutboard of Taiho. And over there they have all the trophies that he won. They've got so many. <laughs> Oh, wow, interesting. So it says that, um, you know, the reason why he became the sumo wrestler in the first place is because, uh, you know, he could eat a lot, you know, mm. the, all the food they were provided in the, in the gym. So that's how he looks like when he first became the sumo wrestler. He was a lot skinnier, right? And, um, yeah, Taiho is not his real name, but it's a ring name. And uh, it says that like uh, his ring name Taiho came from a legendary bird. So if you've watched sumo wrestling before, you know the main objective of the game is to throw your opponent out of the ring, which obviously requires a lot of mass, uh, but it also requires you have really big hands. So uh, this is Taiho's handprint over here, and it says Kurobete uh, Mio, which mean, basically means like, let's compare. So, uh, let's compare. Oh, oh. Not, bad, not bad actually. <laughs> I thought that was going to be way smaller. <laughs> but it's you, almost the same. But you can tell like, the edge of the print mm. is like, where the fingers rolls off. So I think he would have much fatter fingers. Mm. Very interesting though. Proves you can, be, you can be champion, but still have fairly small hands. Oh cool, so this is uh, like an old map of like Edo, Japan, right? Yeah, seems like it. So we're at the Fukagawa Museum right now in the red spot. And over here, you can find like uh, Sensoji in Asakusa. And yeah, here's uh, the famous Kaminari Mon Gate. And in the background, you can see Mount Fuji. And here, it also says like Edojo. And Edojo is like a, a castle where the shogun used to live during the, the Edo period. So do you know this guy, Yasu? Yeah, this guy's called uh, Ino Tadataka, and uh, he's a famous guy for creating the first like, most precise map of Japan. Oh, so he was like a, a cartographer? Yeah, he was. Oh, okay. And he basically walked around like all across Japan to measure like everything by himself. And right. as it says here, the degree of perfection of this map was so high that it was almost the same as the current map of Japan. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Oh wow, man, this is awesome. It's like a just a mini Edo village yeah. in this giant exhibition hall. It's way more impressive than I was expecting. But actually, before I even came in the room, I could hear this animatronic cat sat on the roof over there. Um, kind of keeps moving sometimes and meowing. But yeah, we can go down into the streets and then each of these buildings, uh, I think you can go into all of them. And they're all kind of different stores based around different kind of like crafts and restaurants and I don't know, different stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pumped for this, so I'm, I'm going down. Recreated from the original building plans and materials of the Edo era, this small village certainly delivers an authentic experience. Unfortunately, you're unable to physically enter the buildings, but poking your head in from various angles gives you a good enough view to appreciate the finer details of an average Edo home. So when you think of a popular Japanese dish such as sukiyaki, shabu shabu, or tonkatsu, they're quite meat heavy, right? But traditionally, Japanese people mostly eat rice and these kind of like vegetables. So it's interesting to see how our diet has changed over the last 50 years or even 100 years. So one of the really 
really cool features about this little mini village is this massive wall behind me. It's basically like projects the weather and it kind of cycles through different seasons. So just a few seconds ago, just a massive downpour just started and we just had some lightning as well. And the, the, the lights were flashing and it was crackling. And now it's gone really, really quiet. And it's kind of a bit eerie. But you can hear that, right? It's like there's a storm. Oh, and it's clearing up now. Look, sun's coming out. So it really like, I don't know, it paints such a different mood as the, as the weather changes. The whole atmosphere really kind of changes along with it. It's really, really cool. So this is supposed to be the rice warehouse and as you may know rice is the most essential staple product in Japan at least it was and look at how thick this door is wow yeah it's like a bank vault <laughs> yeah like, it is like gringotts <laughs> exactly so I heard that um, back in the day Japan before it was like the country Japan or Nihon hmm. it was many like separate kingdoms right yeah and their kind of power was measured in how much rice they had Mm. Exactly, so the power of um, each kingdom was measured in something called gokudaka, which means the amount of rice that they can produce in, in a year. Every oh, year. interesting. Mm. Yeah, in business there is a saying, cash is king, but in Japan it literally was rice is king. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. There's a lot to learn here, and seeing how the people of Edo era Japan went about their daily lives is truly fascinating. The whole village isn't that big, but if you want to take it slow and really soak in all the details, then it's an easy way to spend a couple of hours. Currently, there is also another limited time exhibit called Edo no Manga, which even some of you non-Japanese speakers might be able to decipher as meaning the manga of Edo. I'm sure many of you guys at home like manga, but did you know that it has a very long history? So, for example, this one's called uh, Choju Jinbutsu Giga, and this was drawn more than a thousand years ago. And it just shows like uh, frogs and rabbits playing around together. So as you walk around, you can see how manga evolved over time. You look deep in concentration, Julian. Mm, yeah, I'm just reading this, uh, this board here. It's talking about this magazine, it's called The Japan Punch. Mm -hmm. um, and it's saying it was first published in uh, 1853. But it was basically uh, copied the model of a, an English magazine called Punch. Which, oh, really? Yeah, which I've, I've heard of before, um, but it was basically long before I was born. It was mm. like 150 years old. And I think they stopped publishing it maybe in my lifetime, but it, was, it went on for quite a while. It was like over 100 years. So I've seen like references to it before, but it was never like published during my lifetime. But mm. it's kind of interesting to see here, but it actually says that uh, it had the greatest influence on Japanese cartoons. So, you know, you could say that you've got the English to thank for anime and manga. Mm. Do you believe that? <laughs> I can't say I do. <laughs> it's really interesting though, yeah. So yeah, so this one's pretty cool over here because mm -hmm. it's kind of like the frames of a manga, right? Right. But that's like the, going around the wall, that's like the first one we saw that kind of, it looks cool like a modern manga. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, this was the big like turning point for a manga. Mm. And uh, you know, they, they started using like multiple frames in one like il illustration mm. instead of like drawing everything in a giant like one I illustration like this one, for example. Oh, okay. Mm. Interesting. So Hokusai is a famous artist for drawing Great Wave and Mount Fuji and others. But uh, I don't think many people, in, even in Japan, know the fact that he was one of the main innovators of the modern day manga. Although my feeble attempt to accredit one of Japan's biggest cultural exports to the British was an outright failure, it was certainly interesting to see how the art form has evolved over a millennia. On the way out, there's also some more examples of modern takes on traditional styles in the form of the colourful and incredibly creative illustrations drawn onto Emma, which are usually used to write down prayers and wishes when you visit a temple or shrine in Japan. A 
Okay guys, so that's the end of our tour here at the Edo Museum in Fukugawa. What was your favorite part today, Yasu? I really enjoyed this place overall. Mm. It offers a great immersive experience of Edo period. Yeah, certainly immersive. I mean, you can hear all these noises like uh, cicada, men shouting across the rooftop, mm. trying to sell their, their fish and things. Really cool, yeah. Right. So what was your favorite part? Uh, I think for me, just kind of the, the history aspect. You know, I didn't learn a lot of this stuff in school because mm. I didn't grow up in Japan, obviously. So, you know, learning all these facts about Edo, how people used to live their lives. And uh, yeah, I guess I could thank my tour guide here for a lot of the information. He really knows his stuff. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely an underrated spot in Tokyo. So I recommend you guys coming here. Absolutely, me too. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, make sure you subscribe to Ryu Tokyo for new videos every single week. And we'll see you again. See you again next time.